feminist, author, activist, distinguished professor emerita at University of California, Santa Cruz, author of many books, including a new updated edition of her autobiography, Angela Davis. Um, tonight, us at the Audubon Ballroom, which is now the Shabazz Center. Um, democracynow.org will be linking to that YouTube stream. Ben Crump will also be speaking. I will be saying a few words. And Malcolm X's daughter will be introducing and giving a keynote as well, Dr. Ilyasa Shabazz. So go to democracynow.org for the details. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. The viewpoints expressed in this program are the opinions of the people expressing them and are not necessarily those of Fresh Air Incorporated, its staff, or its board of directors. Hey, Al, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Um, I'm wondering if anyone can hear me. Can you hear me? You can hear me, we cannot hear you. So, um, hello everyone. Sometimes this happens. Great. So Al, we still cannot hear you. Do you want to try to unplug your microphone and plug it back in? Because we have such an amazing show with the fabulous guests that we have. I want to make sure that everyone can get all of this great information and all this great task. So why don't we do this? Why don't we go ahead and go back to station? have them play some music for a moment, and then we will come back with this fabulous episode of The Conversation with Alma McFarlane. But we're still live streaming, so that means that there is our viewing audience who can still hear us. So uh, I do not know what to say. Why don't you go out of the studio, Al, and come back in? And in the meantime, I will make sure that everyone knows that the best way that they can support us is to go to YouTube. We are trying to expand our subscribers on YouTube. We have about 300 now. Um, we may have a little bit more than that because you all have been so incredibly gracious by going to YouTube, YouTube slash at insightnews.mn and hitting that subscribe button and actually hitting that bell so you are made aware each and every time we upload a video or we upload anything that is going to bring new content to you, our viewer. How about now? Are you able to hear me? I can hear you perfectly. I don't know what happened. 
but uh, it's good that you're here. I've been telling everybody that the best way to support us is to go to our YouTube channel at Insight News MN and hit the subscribe button and the bell because that will help us get to a place where we can actually uh, start to do some really amazing stuff, not only for them, but for the community. Vosh, thank you. And let me double check with the station to make sure that we uh, are getting the signal out. So uh, station, let us know. Yeah, you don't worry about any of that. I will take okay. care of all of that. You, you focus on making sure well, that you have the best possible show from this moment forward. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Al McFarland. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me take a minute to introduce you, Vash. Uh, Vash Bodhi is one of the executive producers, producers for the conversation and a genius that he is. He solves problems and makes it all work. So Vash, thank you so much. Well, once again, Al McFarland here. Uh, you're listening to The Conversation with Al McFarland. I'm so glad to be with you. And I was saying uh, to myself, apparently, that um, uh, I just uh, adore the fact that our show follows the formidable uh, Amy Goodman. She does such great work in the world. And I appreciate her. I think uh, I join all of you who are listeners here on KFAI really solidly appreciating uh, her visionary, I say revolutionary work. She is a uh, fierce and tireless advocate for democracy, for freedom, for recognizing and supporting dignity of human beings over the planet. So kudos to Amy Goodman and kudos to KFAI. What a wonderful place and space to be in. Well, we've got a great show today. And uh, the main topic today, I'll be bringing in my friends from the uh, Cuban Film Festival to talk about that. Before I do that, I want to do a couple of things that we have been adding recently called the uh, Hot Topics. And one of them uh, involves a uh, uh, community uh, and its need for emergency rental assistance in the Brooklyn Park area. I'm looking at an article on the Insight News website. It's an article uh, by uh, Insight News reporter Vanessa Muthama. And uh, uh, the article is headlined, ACER, A-C-E-R, seeks legislative fast track for emergency rental assistance. Uh, and she says, uh, uh, call uh, legislative leadership fast track emergency rental assistance, close quote. This was ACER's statement to Minnesota residents as a result of the proposed legislation aiming at preventing uh, housing uh, displacements uh, in the community. The, uh, uh, the article said, unfortunately, there's no bill yet, uh, despite uh, lawmakers and Minnesota Housing expressing their interest in fast-tracking emergency rental assistance. Uh, lawmakers must do everything to ensure no family is displaced and unhoused, especially in the colder winter months, said the ACER organization. But what does this actually mean? Uh, uh, and who is ACER? How are they continuing the fight to support uh, that efforts of families have at staying housing, housed. Well, go to insightnews.com and you'll see a story uh, about the background of this organization, uh, ACER. It stands for African Career Education and Resources, Inc. It's a non-governmental organization that provides community services in Brooklyn Park. Uh, and the main focus is Africans in the diaspora, particularly West African immigrants. Their mission uh, statement says it all. They want to build power to achieve systemic change that advances racial and economic e equity for our communities. Well, that's hot topic number one. Uh, hot topic number two is uh, also about a legislative issue, legislative concerns, and that features uh, uh, an article on State Senator Bobby Joe Champion. Uh, the article uh, says, and it's an article from Axios Twin Cities website. It says Senator uh, calls for more investments as Aldi's and Walgreens leave North Minneapolis. Uh, the article reads, a top Minnesota legislature, legislator representing North Minneapolis says state and local lawmakers should do whatever they can do to attract and retain businesses to the neighborhood following the high profile departures of two large retailers. Why it matters? Well, news that 
Aldi and Walgreens are closing their north side locations, sparked concerns about access to grocery stores and pharmacies for area residents. Senator Bobby Joe Champion, who chairs the Senate Jobs and Economic Development Committee, told reporters last week that he's exploring funding or other incentives that the legislature might be able to pass. He says they want to press the city who was taking, uh, talking to those businesses and trying to get a better sense as to what happened, uh, what part uh, of their decision, what was part of their decision making to see if there's anything that you know the state could do. Uh, in the meantime, the champion said the city has got to make some necessary investments to make sure that we are growing businesses in the area, not losing them. Well, those are our hot topics today. Uh, and again, you can often find them right here on uh, insightnews.com. I want to uh, begin today's program with a special brief uh, interview with a, a, a person whose dad I knew but didn't know personally. Uh, and the news is not uh, happy news. It's sad news, but it's important news. Uh, let me introduce Denzel Epps. Denzel Epps called me uh, just recently to let me know that his dad had passed. And we're showing on the screen for those who are watching us on social media. If you're on radio, you have to use your mind's eye. Uh, we're looking at a cover of Insight News from February 2020. And the cover has a wonderful, beautiful, striking photograph of Chef Belvin Hill. Chef Belvin Hill was part of the phenomenal opening of the French Hen restaurant in St. Paul. And I can tell you that uh, he cut a, a striking figure uh, in a Jamaican style, uh, Rasta style, uh, in a community uh, creating a place where healthy food was available, where uh, friendship was available, where people were welcome. Well, Denzel, good afternoon, brother. My condolences again. And I want to take a minute to ask you to talk a little bit about your dad, about uh, uh, Belvin Hill. And, and also to take a minute to let people know that your family has created a GoFundMe initiative to support whatever transitions you will have to make. So good afternoon and welcome to the conversation with Al McFarland. Thank you. Thank you all, man. I appreciate you, Al, and this opportunity to get to talk about, you know, my father's hospitality and experience um, via, you know, South Carolina, all the way up through Mississippi and uh, lastly through Chicago and then planted the seeds here in Minnesota. So I'm very excited. Um, but I want to just open it up with a quick prayer, quick. I think that's relevant and I'll make it real quick here for us um, during this time. Uh, father, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to get to speak on my father's behalf. And we ask that you lead God us, protect us, Lord, through the wilderness, Lord. And we ask that um, there's all great things that have come out of uh, people who want to do the right thing and when they have a will. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Um, I try to always start it off with a good, you know, feel with, when God's present. But um, but basically, yeah, I just want to, you know, let the world know that uh, we lost a real big soldier, a friend, um, and most of all, my father. So, yeah. So talk about his work over at the French Hen. Uh, what was he doing there and what was his style? And you're in the cooking business too, aren't you? Or studying it or tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, just a little bit about me first. I kind of grew up under my dad working at uh, Keys Cafe. He also helped shape um, the, um, the restaurant hospitality over there with Carol. Um, there's some sisters on family on here locally. I'm sure you all probably heard about them. It's, or the restaurant industry is downtown St. Paul, Minneapolis, Roseville. They got a few of them around the Twin Cities here. But basically, yeah, we grew up working for my dad, calling us in in the kitchen to help him out. And I pretty much uh, started my customer service in the restaurant hospitality. And then I transitioned that into face-to-face uh, -face sales. So within the last decade here, I've been working with pro athletes and coaches on contract and negotiating. So now I'm at the University of Houston, finishing up with my master's degree there and to uh, jump into the industry of uh, helping athletes. But but um, as far as the customer service side in the hospitality industry, I pretty much grew up, you know, all of us is eight siblings um, in total. Um, so we got six boys and uh, two girls. And my dad has um, pretty much, you know, helped us throughout the industry. And um, yeah. What was his uh, training and how did he become a chef? Yeah. So basically we traced that through uh, my auntie, Miss Louise Hill. She is um from chicago south side on the building um in inglewood particularly um and then my dad also grew up that's on his mom's side and then most importantly uh, more recently um throughout the last couple of decades he was raised with um carolyn fell so that's on his dad's side which is where that jamaican um slash haitian side come from 
Um, and we uh, pretty much grew up, he grew up around his first cousins, uh, Constance Taylor Hill, um, or excuse me, Constance Fells. She's um, a very good, uh, very close first cousin of my father's and she pretty much helped raise him outside of my uh, my grandma. So she pretty he pretty much learned from both sides, his mom's side and his dad's side. So and he pretty much brought that here to Minnesota. What do you think uh, he wants his legacy to be as a chef? What uh, energy, what vibration was he uh, sharing uh, with customers uh, through his cooking, through his culinary genius? Just really taking all, you know, notations and not, you know, no big eyes, no little use. Everybody can learn something. My dad picked up from from everybody and basically um, he wanted to, you know, infrastructure that into his cooking, the taste, the feel. Um, creating a different um, culture so people can cultivate into the food. Um, food has its own culture outside of people. So my dad wanted to push that through his legacy of the food, of the taste and the smell. Listen, you told me that uh, you guys have a GoFundMe. Let's let people know uh, what that is. And if people want to support uh, the family in this uh, moment of transition, uh, as your dad is transferred, transformed uh, into uh, the realm of the ancestors, let's let people know how to connect and support. Yeah, the GoFundMe link, um, I do believe I submitted it to Vaj. He should be able to provide that in the, the link somewhere, but it is a GoFundMe link under, um, I believe it's under my name, Denzel Epps. So they can search it under that. And uh, if anyone got any questions, they can call me um, as well. Um, I'm you know, not hard to find. If there's any questions, I could be reached on Facebook as well at um, Don, that's D-O-N slash uh, Be Great. So that's B-E-G-R-E-A-T. Um, you should see a picture with me with my cap and gown on. And then also, I believe there's a link there. If you all can go to the GoFundMe link um, and it's uh, slash, it's an ID number. 08970E1C as in Charlie. Uh, so that's GoFundMe um, with a, um, a slash link of 08970E1C. Uh, right now we are kind of struggling financially. My dad didn't have life insurance. Um, so we are trying to uh, create um, um, some funds here so we can go ahead and uh, have a proper burial for, for our father. Denzel, uh, I'm sure our community is going to respond. Thank you very much. And again, condolences to you. But uh, I also joined the community in celebrating the memory, the work, the mission, the passion that uh, your dad brought to loving his work and loving his family and loving the community as well. Brother, thank you. Thank you so much. And you take care. Okay. Uh, regards to all of the family. Thank you. I appreciate the time. God bless all you right. all. Stay safe. All right. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. I want to pivot now to the next and the balance of the program. Uh, two good friends of mine are here. Uh, Franklin Corbello uh, is here. And also uh, Frank, let's see, let me move my camera up here, uh, is here. Uh, Greg Clavi. Greg Clavi is here. Uh, Frank and, and, and Greg have been involved with the um, uh, Cuban Film Festival forever. So what is the Cuban Film Festival? Let me tell you about that. Uh, uh, just a second here. I'll pull my notes up. And uh, well, before I do, we've got a, a trailer. And so you'll be able to hear it on the radio, but if you're online with us at Facebook or YouTube, you'll be able to see it. Let's watch the trailer on the, uh, the Cuban Film Festival. Thank you. 
a perfect trailer because it works perfectly for radio audiences but uh, the extra bonus is those who are watching on the digital media platforms got to see some wonderful artwork as well greg clavi franklin corbello buenas tardes caballeros como están ustedes bienvenido gracias gracias thank you for having us you know, on your show al yeah. Well, thank you for being um, here. Let me let me just read a little bit about uh, the history. This is the 14th Minnesota Cuban Film Festival that takes place from March 1 through April 5th. Uh, again, supported by the Minneapolis-St. Paul MSP Film Society. It's going to be at Main Theater in Minneapolis. And since 2010, the Minnesota Cuba Film Festival, MCFF, has brought to our land of 10,000 lakes some of the best Cuban films. This year's festival takes place uh, as part of the MSP Film Festival at Main Theater, six consecutive Wednesdays, March 1 through April 5th. Uh, the uh, Cuban Film Festival features films that address the achievements and challenges challenges, challenges of the Cuban people uh, through the eyes of the filmmakers. The festival highlights diverse and challenging films of social change, of human struggle, and the boldness of the human spirit. And the objective of the Minnesota Cuba Committee, the presenter of the film festival, remains to offer Minnesotans a chance to learn about and appreciate Cuban films and culture and to remind our supporters of the onerous burden that the blockade inflicts on the Cuban people. In spite of ongoing economic challenges and the US blockade, Cuba shows the way forward with medical research environmental sustainability, and the new progressive family code. That's great background. Uh, Greg, talk about uh, you and Franklin and others coming up with the, the mission and the uh, what really motivated you. I mean, you said it here, but say it in your words, why this is so important to do. Uh, well, um, first of all, I want to point out the music that was the background for the trailer. Uh, the music was from Charanga Tropical, which is a local band. Um, in fact, they just uh, played at the Dakota last night, and you can see them at various venues throughout the um, Minneapolis area. Um, they're a fantastic band. We have one of the most um, vibrant um, Cuban band uh, environments in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And it's that culture, um, the vibrancy of the Cuban culture that I believed would attract people um, to learn more about Cuba. Uh, because once you hear it, once you see their art, once you see their film, you can see that these people are on a path to a better world. Um, and so that, that's what got me going to Cuba in 2010 on a, um, a license to study with the Cuban Film Institute. Um, and I brought back Cuban films and started it in 2010. Um, I think that uh, Cuba resembles a bond between the African diaspora of the United States, as well as the rest of the um, Americas um, mm -hmm. in creating a culture that enriches our lives in many ways. And if given the um, resources to continue um, their path, um, 
that they would lead us toward uh, better futures for healthcare, education, environmental protection, etc. Um, so I think uh, another reason is is the the bond that's been created between the African diaspora of the United States and the African diaspora of Cuba, but also includes um, the progressive politics uh, of America too. Um, in supporting um, people seeking liberation, uh, mm -hmm. democracy, and freedom, uh, contrary mm -hmm. to what U.S. media um, uh, of the status quo of the corporate U.S. media would tell us. Uh, Franklin, jump in and add to that. Why is it important that we uh, try to lift up the, uh, the genius of Cuban filmmaking and creativity and art uh, in ways to uh, show the pathway to uh, all of us becoming better human beings. Right. Uh, I just want to add that, you know, besides, you know, <clears throat> besides the Cuban uh, the, uh, committee and, you know, but the, and the film society, we have the invaluable help for so many years of the Cuban Film Institute. Without them, it would have been difficult for us <clears throat> to have access to the latest releases, you know, from, from Cuba. And uh, give us, you know, but the, um, a, a great, you know, support from them. And we are very appreciative. And that kind of show you the level of solidarity that Cuba show, not just to us, but to the world. Mm. They are open, you know, they are solidarity in terms of ideas, solidarity in terms, you know, when there's a disaster, and the far ends of the world, there is, you know, a Cuban team of doctors going there to help. Uh, where there is a need, you know, too, but the, uh, because of the embargo, and not, not be able to have, you know, the components to, to be able, you know, to provide healthcare to the, you know, the community, to the population. Cuba, you know, but have, you know, the ability to create their own vaccines. Uh, Cuba is able, you know, to be able to come up with, you know, with the, uh, you know, but the uh, uh, drugs that they are not allowed here in the United States that they could save a lot of lives, especially, you know, about the diabetes and, you know, the lung cancer. That shows, you know, how important it is that, you know, that <clears throat> the, the ability, uh, how important it is that the, the American people and the Cuban people, which, by the way, we are all in the same family. Mm. We are, it was not the backyard. We're just, you know, but the, you know, but, but very or worse, we are, you know, but, you know, but tied together. And the better, you know, the more, the more that we understand each other, the less fear, you know, America will feel about Cuba. So Cuba loves baseball. Cuba mm -hmm. loves jazz. Cuba, you know, is, is about America. You know, but the, so despite, you know, what people say that they are, it's a, Cuba is us. And we carry Cuba, you know, but they for many, many centuries in our heart. Many years ago, uh, there was a pageant in St. Paul uh, celebrating, you know, but the, the end of that, you know, the, the, uh, the Cuba, uh, the uh, Spain war. So there was a big celebration on the West Side. And, uh, they, and they were celebrating, you know, but some children were named after, you know, a, a, a great, you know, but general and the Cuban, you know, but the fight against Spain. Ma Maceo, you mm -hmm. know, a lot, of, a lot of people call it Maceo, but mm -hmm. it was remembering, it was a whole week of you know, all kinds of activities. If you, uh, <clears throat> the Minnesota Historical Society have a great background in that pageant. Uh, I, I wish, you know, but a lot of African Americans will remember, you know, but the 100 years ago, have, you know, but they're respectable, I have, you know, but they being able you know, to identify you know, about the struggle of, you know, the Cuban people to, for independence from Spain. So that's well, kind of what they might take, but why mm. it's important, you know, to, to, to tighten around because, you know, we are family. Mm -hmm. you know, but this, is, this is what I feel, that's the word that I use most often. And the solidarity is what they bind us together. Walk us through some of the titles of the films that will be uh, being presented during the festival, I think. Uh, sort of go through uh, them one by one, maybe, and let people know uh, what's going to be happening. Uh, both of you guys can do that. 
Yeah. We have an interesting, you know, but it's always a challenge to find, you know, there are only six films that we feature in, you know, but, uh, in our festivals. But it's always a challenge to find a nice balance of, you know, about the uh, a documentary feature. This year, we have, you know, about achieved, you know, to be able to have three, you know, feature films and three documentaries. Mm. Uh, one that is open, you know, on March 1st, on Wednesday, is Cuento, <clears throat> excuse me, Cuento de un Día Más, Tales of One More Day. Mm. What is unique about this is it takes place in the context of the COVID-19. You know, what the, how Cuba was able, you know, to deal with that. I have people, you know, but were able, you know, to uh, uh, navigate, you know, but uh, in, in, in have people, you know, relate to do that. So, Cuento de Diamante, there are six stories by six different teams, by six directors. And the overall direction, another, you know, a renowned, you know, but the uh, film director called Fernando Perez. And all this, you know, direct, the young director, young, you know, filmmakers, are part of the future of filmmaking in Cuba. So that was very important, you know, about this film, because it gives us, you know, an understanding how, ta- how, ta- how, many, how much talent, you know, those individuals have. I have, you know, but they, they are bursting in the scene. They want, you know, to show to the world that this is Cuento de un Día Más. Okay. But the one, you know, on, uh, on, on March 8th, this is a very rare, <clears throat> excuse me, rare, you know, but view of something that very, is very little known outside Cuba. It's about the religion and the society called the Abaqua Society. And this is something that, you know, came, you know, with the slaves. It has a root, you know, in Nigeria and mm-hmm. in West Africa. But it took root, you know, about the, in Cuba uh, around, I say, about the 150 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, history is called, you know, but known generally as Ekpe, Egbo, Nave, Ube among the multilingual group in the region. It was believed that Nanigos, as the members are known, could be transformed into leopard to stalk their enemies. So this is give an understanding, you know, but they have, you know, but those traditions still live on and they're very strong, you know, in Cuba. By the way, this Abaqua religion and society is, 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 is the only country in the world that still have, you know, that tradition. So okay. that, I think it's going to be a treat. Then we're not going to have, we're going to move into a lighter, lighter you know, about, uh, you know, about the fair and uh, uh, March 15 called Havana Selfie. Havana Selfie was, you know, about the sex story, about, you know, the life, you know, about the people. Uh, you know, about, it, <clears throat> it was a film, you know, about the commemorate the 500 years, uh, 500 anniversary of the foundation of Havana. So the director Santana was able, you know, to go to different neighborhoods, telling different stories to give you a sense, you know, about the how people, you know, about they are, you know, about living, you know, about they, you know, in those days. And then there's a, something very special, uh, especially perhaps, you know, about the uh, Greg can, can talk about it, is about you know uh, how the efforts that Cuba is doing to preserve the natural habitat especially okay. the coral reef. They're doing, you know, they have, you know, a program called Tarea Vida, which is a very multifaceted, you know, about the approach. And, you know, the director of the film, uh, the producer, Dr. Jaffe from Glasgow, Scotland, went to Cuba to document the efforts that then talk to the people that are actually implementing, you know, about the, the plan. Mm-hmm. So, Greg, you know, but, Greg, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, that? about, you know, what Cuba is doing, you know, to what the, uh, regarding the environment. And before you do, let me remind people, this is the conversation with Alan McFarland. I'm Alan McFarland. My guests are Franklin Corbello. You just heard him and Greg Clavi. You'll hear in a second. And we're talking about the Minnesota Cuban Film Festival. Uh, Greg, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one of the features of the film festival, um, that, uh, I had thought of in the beginning was after each film, um, people need to sit down and talk about the film and have discussion about the content because so many times you see inspirational films and you don't really have anybody to share the impact of that film with you at the moment. 
And so that's one of our features is that after each film, we have panel discussions with people who know the issues that the film has brought up. And we're able to um, talk about how people um, saw the film, how it impacted them, um, how they relate to it. Um, and so Life's Project, Tierra Vida, um, is primarily about how Cuba is trying to combat the changes that are going on in the environment, such mm -hmm. as the rising of the ocean level with the melting of the ice caps um, that is threatening their coastal sea towns. Of course, Cuba has uh, a large border facing the oceans um, with uh, uh, fishing villages and towns, especially such as Havana, which is right on the ocean, that um, they will need to protect or actually move inland. Um, but it not only goes there, but it also goes on to protecting water resources. How do they grow crops? Um, how do they reforest their areas so that um, they're able to um, have that kind of environment that continues to be good habitat for the animals and birds that live there and migrate there during the winter mm -hmm. that make that a special place. It's extraordinary. There are so many species that live only in Cuba and nowhere else in the world. Um, and Cuba is trying to totally convert to um, sustainable energy um, because the blockade has kept them from being able to use um, energy that would be provided by um, oil in thermal plants, um, et cetera. And so uh, they're trying to do these projects without the ability to have investment or funding come in from other countries around the world because of the blockade is, is so severe. Um, I just want to say one thing about Havana Selfies is mm -hmm. anybody who's been to Havana knows it's a magical city. It's, it's one of the most often revisited cities. It's one of the cities that when tourists go there, they want to return a second time, a third mm -hmm. time, a fourth time, because it's so magical. Havana Selfies is a tribute to Havana. So to see it, you see some of the magic of Havana and how people continue to live with all the films, how people continue to live and have productive lives, even without material goods, even in um, the uh, challenges of uh, deprivation, and even with um, even to sometimes have an adequate diet. Um, the blockade is, is that severe. It reminds mm. me of the black communities in the United States during reconstruction when we ended slavery and had a great revolution that was supposed to turn the tide of our country and black communities and black people began to prosper in the economy. And it was under attack from white supremacists. I liken uh, Cuba, uh, United States blockade of Cuba very similar to the white supremacy attack on black communities um, that even exists today. That's interesting. I want to go into that. <clears throat> two films you haven't mentioned so far. The last two are Vincenta B, which is a drama. Uh, and you also haven't uh, spent time with, uh, give some information on the last one, Nino, Nino Rivera, Cuevas de Oro, Golden Strings, another documentary. What about those two films? Right, right. So uh, Vicenta Bay is, you know, uh, the director is a well-known director, very accomplished, Carlo Lechuga. And it tells, you know, the story of a respected Santera in Havana who has the gift of clairvoyance. The film, you know, about the, uh, from one side of the world, however, tend to gravitate and set light. Let me see. Her, while her business thrives, she hopes her son continue the family tradition of helping others. That's, that's her desire. But 
he decides you know, to emigrate and Vicenta finds herself in a crisis of faith and loses her gift. Mm-hmm. She finds herself questioning her life, but also unable to understand why she has been left alone in a country where everyone seems to have lost their faith. So there is a parallel about you know, the migration. There's a lot of sons and husbands have left, sons, you know, but they, that leaves their mothers behind. So this is an interesting you know, study. You can, you can, you know, but they read between the lines. Mm. But, you know, but what I want to highlight is, you know, but the role, which, you know, but uh, the main character, she is prodding in every frame and she does a wonderful job. I really highly recommend for people to go and see Vicenta Bay because it's, it's going to bring, you know, bring you some tears to your eyes and understanding about the role of Santeras in Havana. Now, mm. Moving on, move, moving on to about, excuse me, moving on to the last two, uh, the feature that, you know, but even though it's an animation feature, it's a musical called mm. Chico and Rita. This, you know, Chico and Rita, you know, won a lot of awards for the originality and for the accomplishment you know, of uh, the techniques. And it, uh, it's a love story about, you know, about the, uh, a Cuban singer in the 1940s, uh, and Chico, uh, pianist. And uh, they both struggle, and, uh, and then uh, Rita is you know, lured to New York, and uh, they and leave you know, Chico behind. They are madly in love. And then, you know, about life, you know, has, has rather tumbles. And then, you know, in the end, there is, you know, the reencounter. It's a beautiful, beautiful dance, and also great, you know, soundtracks. Uh, they are great musicians, jazz musicians. Now, to close, you know, about the, you know, about, uh, the selection of the films, we've, we have a local uh, the singer, Cuban singer called Gloria Rivera, who mm-hmm. sings, you know, with a local band, uh, Salsa del Sol, and she's been here for a number of years. But her father was another influential musician uh, that played the tres. It's a kind of a Cuban instrument. But it was it was an arranger, it was you know a composer. It's called Nino Rivera. That's why Gloria Gloria Rivera is also known as Gloria La Nina Rivera. So it's an interesting you know about the uh, uh, study of the period in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, they have you know by Cuba, most uh, everybody know too, but they uh, export you know but great you know music and genres. Uh, they know even uh, they know. I don't know if you're familiar with you know the genre feeling, and that's mm-hmm. something you know, is the Cuban the Cuban you know about the, um, the interpretation of you know blues, mm-hmm. uh, but it was so uh, that's going to be a quite a treat. Gloria is going to be present uh, that the showing you know that documentary. I might even you know sing one of her, her father's famous uh, wow. tune called El Jamaicano. The, the, the Jamaican one. Mm-hmm. So we are looking forward to that, you know, closing with a lot of music and also to have honor the, the life and the uh, artistry of Nino Rivera and uh, for his being, you know, but very humble, but very, very talented individual, very influential to a lot of musicians, you know, from that time. Let me do this, uh, ask you a couple, a couple of questions about the uh, Cuban community here in Minnesota. Uh, what would you say is the size uh, of the Cuban community? I think uh, Cubans know themselves, but in general, there's not an appreciation of uh, the Cuban-ness uh, of elements of our community. That's what I think. I could be wrong. What, what do you guys say? That's question number one. And I want to have that lead to question number two. And that is the question, Greg, that you've uh, uh, discovered or discussed a little bit about the relationship between uh, the Africanity, the uh, uh, African diaspora that Cuba, in a sense, is the center of, and it binds uh, the other descendants of the uh, African slave trade descendants of Africa, not only in the U.S. and the Caribbean, but also throughout the Americas. And it seems to me that awareness of that uh, common bond, common experience, and the potential to articulate a a common uh, uh, 
rediscovery, maybe rebirth uh, across the continent and across the world is at hand right now. So talk about that. How, how, how does the Cuban community see itself and how is it seen in Minnesota? And then talk about the question of Africa, Cuba. Yeah, um, <clears throat> recent census uh, has put the uh, population of Cubans who have migrated to Minnesota from Cuba um, for somewhere uh, between 250 and 300 um, in the population. So it's relatively small. It's spread out um, throughout Minnesota. Um, its impact is mostly felt in the areas of um, music, art, um, health care. Um, Cuba has, of course, been on the forefront of health care um, for many decades, um, especially after the development of, um, well, the, their belief that health care is a universal right that is written in their constitution. So it's free for everybody in Cuba. And when you go down there, you don't have to deal with any insurance agency. You just go to a clinic and a hospital and you get treated. Um, and they provide um, health care with mortality rates that are much lower than the United States, uh, life expectancy that's much higher than the United States itself, and infant and uh, maternal mortality rates that are way lower than the United States. Um, and so people from the United States who have went to Cuba to see the healthcare system and study it have come back impressed so much that um, when Cuban doctors do immigrate to the United States, they have come to Minnesota here. And the University of Minnesota has now a memorandum of understanding to collaborate on healthcare And I think we here. lost, uh, there we go, yeah. Yeah, this was just signed last year, um, this memorandum of understanding. So that's how Cuba has impacted Minnesota, and Minnesota has impacted Cuba. Um, as well as in the areas, we have such a rich um, artistic community in the areas of dance and music, um, because Minnesotans who have went to Cuba um, because of their fame in those areas have studied and become so impressed that they, they've taken on the study of that culture and it, and then have integrated it in their own dance and music. Um, so the connection is not only of the African diaspora, but it's also a human connection um, mm -hmm. that bonds us. Again, that, that uh, focus on solidarity that we have to see ourselves as one family. We can't be divided by um, political issues and, and, and political boundaries. Um, so, um, well, but you mentioned, yeah. you mentioned, Greg, the um, the um, the sense that uh, the blockade against Cuba is reminding you of that period after Reconstruction when white supremacy. Uh, through Jim Crow and the Klan uh, really unleashed uh, a horrific uh, crime against uh, humanity in its treatment, uh, in effect, re-enslavement of African people by denying them opportunity, denying their humanity, and creating laws that and structures that permanently depressed uh, and suppressed opportunity for Black people. The same exists there. So the question to me, uh, is a question about the question of uh, uh, the presence of African people throughout the hemisphere. A and the important thing, Franklin, is that I uh, have often said that as a, a, a person of African descent in the United States, uh, our culture has us look inward and we somehow think that, you know, we are the only victims of the transatlantic slave trade of the the movement of the colonizer culture out of Europe. But the fact of the matter is that there are more of us who are African 
in Brazil, for example, than anywhere else, and that our people exist throughout the Americas, in Peru, in Uruguay, uh, in Argentina, in Colombia, Bolivia, but we are not encouraged to know that we exist in all those places. Our people exist in Mexico, you know, throughout Central America, but we are not encouraged to believe that uh, these are our cousins, our neighbors, our friends, people from our own tribes, perhaps that we have been socialized away from knowing. And so what I expect and what I believe is at hand is the ability, and I think the film festival is one of the tools for that, to connect our people, the African people, to everybody else in the culture as well. But certainly we have to know ourselves and be uh, free to express our authentic selves, to live inside of our own identity as descendants uh, of Africa and as uh, uh, persons in the diaspora that is huge, that our creativity, our music, our dance, uh, our, our blues, our literature really, uh, uh, you know, think of, um, you know, jazz and, and Afro-Latin jazz, think of uh, reggae out of Jamaica. Uh, the, the music we create is the soundtrack of life on the planet right now. The whole world uh, is experiencing the African heart beat uh, through the music of salsa, uh, the music Cuban jazz, the music of reggae. So where does it lead us from your point of view, Franklin, Greg? Uh, how do we see um, uh, the change? How do you see the change that I think is uh, inevitable and imminent right now? Uh, Franklin, you first. Yeah, I think it's very important people remember the history. You know, right now there is so much, you know, talk about, you know, nothing you know, about teaching, you know, about the Afri you know, about African American history and schools. I think it's very important people know the connection, you know, what went on, you know, about the 200 years ago. And that the, so, of course, you know, we have to know the history to make sure that we are not, <clears throat> we're not committing the same mistake, you know, we did in the past. And also to have a full understanding about that this is what America is all about. It's not about, you know, whites or black. It's about, you know, by when we come together as a human beings, you know, our, you know, but the, our blood is red running through our veins. So, but the, so it's very important, you know, that we fully understand, especially young people have to fully understand, you know, but the, the history behind what it is, you know, about this experiment of the, you know, by, of America. So with that, you know, but they you know about the, the contribution of immigrants or slaves, you know, you know, it would have been possible, you know, but this American exceptionalism, so, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that people fully understand and appreciate and respect, you know, but the, the contribution of, you know, but the, uh, the Chinese or the Italian, the, African, the, the, the Africans, you know, but they all together, you know, but is what, you know, makes uh, us Americans. And not just you yeah. know for one group or the other, are for, are, as a collective, you know, but cohesive group, looking forward, you know, to raise our children, giving you know opportunities, equal opportunity for everybody. So that's what I feel that is very important: education, and of course, you know, but the, let's not forget economic, you know, but equality, economic. Well, Franklin, is to, is to say and to frame this as an American opportunity. Is that enough? because I'm thinking that the challenges really have to be viewed from a different lens. And that if we uh, confine ourselves to what is traditionally perceived as the interest, uh, the line of thinking from America and American exceptionalism, we're gonna end up with a guaranteed uh, system that supports what has had, happened already, which is disenfranchisement. How do we break out of the, uh, the, uh, the horror, right? Uh, and I think you said it, you have to teach and tell the truth. Tell the That's truth right. and, and tell it and recognize that everybody uh, has been a part of all that has happened. Go ahead, Franklin. Yeah, not only have been, but it still is a struggle. And of course, you know, but the, you know, but as I always say, you know, in order to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. Yeah. So, which means, you know, but you have to fight, you know, try you know, to correct Try, you know, to, to carve a better future for our children and grandchildren. 
And that takes, you know, but from the beginning of this nation, there's always, it was, you know, but a struggle, the struggle to oppression, you know, religious, you know, but the and injustice and so on. So we are living, you know, but the very perilous time, which means, you know, we have, you know, to really, really think hard if we want to protect, you know, but the ourselves and this democracy, we have to work very hard, you know, together, not divided, because, you know, when you are divided, you know, but the enemy conquers. Mm -hmm. So we have to really find our common, you know, our common commonalities and, and, and the interests and trying you know, to, to find, you know, but the look, you know, but the, that the bright, you know, but star in the north and be able, you know, to you know, visualize what it is, you know, to live in a world where, you know, a young African American can walk in the streets without fear to being stopped by the police and freaked right. by the police, right. or, or even worse, being shot by the police. Yeah. So that's it to me is a is a myself personally, I feel enraged that the, even in the 21st century, African American and also about the you know but any people of color, mm -hmm. you know, the parents had to teach their children how to behave when they when they face you know a situation the police stop them. Be a white policeman yeah. or black policeman. Greg, yeah, Greg, but yeah. I, I also hear that even in Cuba now, that the uh, young black hip hop generation in particular is unhappy and uh, articulates a sense of being um, marginalized. Uh, when was the last time you were in Cuba, and what's your sense of uh, uh, how successful Cuba has been in eliminating? the vestiges of colorism and racial bias, because that was part of the problem. Cuba was affected like everybody else in the world with right. white supremacist mm -hmm. ideology. Yeah, um, I've been there um, seven times since 2006. I've had the opportunity to meet with hip hop artists um, from Cuba. In fact, I went down there with um, American hip hop artists um, who collaborated with Cuban hip hop artists and then created, then did a concert, a public concert. Was that um, with Maria, with Maria Issa? Or not no, Maria, no, it, no, it was, it was with Pastors for Peace. Okay. Um, and, and so, um, of course, what we have, one has to realize that with a blockade, the goal of the blockade is create deprivation and starvation so that the conditions are deteriorated so bad that the people begin to, to think. And then on top of that, feed them propaganda through um, Radio Marti and other streams of um, social media that are bombarded to Cuba to think that the problems that are created by the blockade, deprivation and starvation are the problems of from the Cuban government themselves. Um, a government Listen, that we're, those- we're out, we're, out, we're out of time. We've got about one minute left. Uh, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Franklin. So, and Greg, anyways, what? it's a, a constant social um, issue that they deal with and it's their solidarity of being united that they're able to handle the, the, the um, the campaign, that continued social media campaign that now the United States has taken on to try to disconnect the people. We got to drop it right um, there. Uh, go oh, and oh, check I out see. the uh, Minnesota Cuban yeah. Film Festival. Come to the I'm Film Festival. We'll, <laughs> we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.